Hello everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Camille Meir and I'm on the events team at the bookstore and I'm thrilled to be welcoming Elvira Navarro to present her new story collection, Rabbit Island, out from Two Lines Press in conversation with the book's translator, Christina McSweeney, and another wonderful author, Sarah Rose Etter. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. So I want to give a huge thanks to Elvira, Christina, and Sarah, and our interpreter Marta for joining us this evening. So quickly to housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they can't hear or see you. So if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your question. You can do that throughout the event and we'll address them throughout the discussion or at the very end. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, there's also a chat button um, at the bottom of the screen where I will be posting a link to purchase Rabbit Island. So please keep an eye out for that link and make sure to buy the book. Um, one caveat for tonight's event, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections um, and you know our home server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We will try to solve them as quickly as possible. Uh, we'll be continuing our virtual series across the winter and spring, so please head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One event that I want to spotlight is that this Thursday, we'll be thrilled to have Ankana Schofield present her new novel, Bina, a novel in warnings, in conversation with Elif Batuman, part of our ongoing series with the New York Review of Books. Uh, registrations for that event are live now, so please check it out and register. Uh, so now just a little bit about our authors and we'll get started after that. Elvira Navarro is an author of multiple novels and short stories, including The City in Winter, The Happy City, A Working Woman, and many more works. Her novel, The Happy City, or La Ciudad Feliz, won the High End Fiction Award, the Tormenta Award, and was selected as one of the books of the year by Culturas, the arts and culture supplement of the Spanish newspaper Publico. Granta Mag named her one of their top 22 Spanish writers under the age of 35. Um, Elvira contributes to numerous cultural magazines such as El, Mundo's, El Mundo newspapers El Cultural and to the newspapers Publico and El País. She writes literary reviews for Que Leer and contributes to the blog La Tormenta and Un Vaso. She also teaches creative writing. Christina McSweeney received the 2016 Valle Inclán Prize for her translation of Valeria Luiselli's The Story of My Teeth. Her, her translation of Among Strange Victims by Daniel Saldana Paris was a finalist for the 2017 Best Translated Book Award. Um, among the other authors she's translated are, of course, Elvira Navarro, Veronica gerber bisecchi and Julian Herbert. Sarah Rose Etter is the author of a short fiction collection, Tongue Party, from Cake Train Press, and a novel forthcoming from Two Dollar Radio called The Book of X. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in The Cut, Electric Literature, Vice, Guernica, Philadelphia Weekly, and more. She is the recipient of writing residencies at the Disquiet International Program in Portugal and the Golkestan Creative Writing Program in Iceland. Um, Elvira, Christina, Sarah, I will leave the virtual stage to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. What a room of brilliant women to be with today. I'm really, really excited. Um, also wanted to be really thankful to Two Lines Press and the Center for Art and Translation um, and Community Bookstore for hosting us today. Uh, one of the reasons I love to work with Two Lines and Cat is that we both believe in the ability of literature to break down the boundaries between people and a world in which we exchange our art across space and language is a richer one. So today I'm really excited to get to speak with Elvira about the incredible Rabbit Island out today um, and Christina about bringing those stories into English. Uh, I learned a lot reading this brilliant collection which the New York Times calls impressionistic and dreamlike and Publishers Weekly calls arresting with starkly elegant prose and a winking sense of humor. Um, today we're going to have Elvira do a short reading from Rabbit Island to kick things off which Christina will translate and then we will get into a Q&A. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us and I'm excited to hear your reading Elvira. Thank you. Mm. Voy a traducir. Eh, 
Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Eh, estoy muy entusiasta a trabajar con, eh, con vosotras. Eh, me encanta trabajar en situaciones donde pueda, eh, digamos, superar las barreras eh, lingüísticas y de la distancia. Entonces, estoy muy entusiasta de eh, tener aquí Elvira Navarro y Cristina Mexuini. Eh, Elvira es la autora de eh, La isla de los conejos y leyéndolo aprendí muchísimo. Eh, y también es un, un libro que tiene una prosa muy elegante. Y entonces ahora Elvira va a dar una lectura de una, una parte de, del libro y en es español y luego Cristina va a leer la misma parte en inglés. Hola, estoy muy contenta de poder participar en esta presentación y de poder ver a Sara y a Cristina y, y a Marta. A, a, a Cristina ya la conocía, pero a Marta y a Sara no. Y para mí es un gran honor estar aquí y... Y quería dar especialmente las gracias a la editorial Chula Impress por confiar en mí. Sé que eh, traducir a, a, bueno, a gente joven siempre es un, una, una apuesta fuerte por parte de una editorial y muy valiente. Y, y yo me siento muy, muy, muy honrada de, de poder estar en, en el sello. Y también darle también especialmente las gracias a Cristina, que es el segundo libro que me traduce y, y, y que es una eh, traductora absolutamente maravillosa. Y darle, por supuesto, las gracias a Sara por participar en esta, en esta conversación tan, eh, tan generosamente y, y a Marta, que, que nos hace de, de, de traductora. Marta, cuando yo me tenga que parar, me, me lo dices. Que... Entonces, no sé si quieres que hacer una pausa y traducir. Sí, o, tra o vale. tra si, no, si no te molesta, traduzco. Y... Sí, sí. Gracias. Uh, well, uh, I'm very, very excited, very happy to be here, uh, to see Sarah, Cristina and Marta. Uh, I feel honored to take part into, um, into this event. I would also like to thank the publisher uh, for uh, trusting me. Uh, I know that translating young authors is not always easy. It's uh, uh, a strong bet, let's say, uh, on, on their part. So I feel really, really honored to be here. I would also like to thank Christina, uh, who is the translator of my, well, she has already translated uh, Um, two books of mine and uh, she, she did a wonderful job. Uh, I would also like to thank Sara for being here so generously and of course Marta for the translation. Thank you. Bueno, voy a leer un, un pequeño fragmento que corresponde al cuento que le da título a, al libro La isla de los conejos y es el inicio de, del texto y, y bueno, eh, si quieres traducir y a continuación leo. Uh, well, I'm going to read a short passage from the book. Uh, it's um, the story that then gives the title to the whole book and it's just the beginning of this story. Gracias. La isla de los conejos. Construyó una piragua y quiso probarla en el Guadalquivir. No le interesaba el deporte. Tampoco había hecho la piragua para usarla a menudo. Sabía que, en cuanto explorara las isletas, la dejaría en el trastero o la vendería. Él se definía como inventor, aunque las cosas que fabricaba no se les podía llamar inventos. Sin embargo, había empezado a calificar como tales todo lo, per, lo que pergeñaba, pues no usaba manual de instrucciones. Su método era descubrir por sí mismo lo necesario para elaborar lo que ya estaba hecho. El proceso le llevaba meses y lo consideraba su verdadera vocación. Inventaba lo que ya estaba inventado. Conseguía con ello un placer parecido al de los senderistas que los domingos van al monte y alcanzan una cumbre y se preguntaba por qué la realización personal era algo tan extraño. Por las mañanas, 
el falso inventor trabajaba como maestro en una escuela de artes oficios sin sentirse realizado, a pesar de que sus enseñanzas resultaban útiles para sus alumnos. Desde niño había deseado ir a las lenguas de tierra que penetran en el mar o a las islas que nadie habita. En una ocasión, cuando tenía 18 años, sus padres le invitaron a Tabarca con la promesa de que era una isla desierta. Él creyó que iban a pisar mero matorral, pero se encontró con siete calles de casas humildes, una muralla, una iglesia, un faro, dos hoteles y un pequeño puerto. Probablemente sus padres exagerasen con que no había tanta barca para convencerle de que se fuera con ellos de vacaciones. No les gustaba que se quedara solo en casa. No obstante, tal vez nunca hubiesen entendido a qué se refería cuando hablaba de lugares deshabitados. Era difícil contar las mejanas de la parte del Guadalquivir que bordeaba la ciudad. Algunas se confundían con pequeñas penínsulas. Una mañana de septiembre caminó hasta el muelle con su embarcación y se echó al agua. Estuvo varios días tomándole el pulso a la nave y tras dominarla comenzó a explorar el río. Llevaba semanas sin llover. El caudal iba escaso, tranquilo, apestoso. Recorrió el perímetro de las con una mezcla de desasosiego y estupor sin ser capaz de arrimar la piragua a la orilla dudaba de sus habilidades para maniobrar con rapidez temía que la tierra no fuera firme en las márgenes resbalar y que la, la, que la piragua se le escapara además le espantaba regresar a nado apretando los labios para no tragar miasmas y viendo tanta naturaleza junta la vegetación abigarrada y vibrante de insectos la capa de excrementos de pájaro el lodo lo que había creído bello no eran más que árboles torcidos por el peso de las aves, o quizá por alguna enfermedad, así como colonias de bichos y arbustos comidos por la inmundicia. Um, right, so uh, now we have Rabbit Island in English. Uh, it's beautiful to hear your voice, Alvaro. Es un honor to escuchar tu voz. It's I want to also thank Community Bookstore and Two Lines and Cat. you know, like as Elvira says, it's amazing to work with you all and so thank you. So, Rabbit Island. He built a canoe and wanted to try it out on the Guadalquivir River. Sports didn't interest him and he hadn't made the canoe for regular use. Once he'd explored the small river islands, it would be relegated to the junk room or sold. He thought of himself as an inventor, although the things he made couldn't be called inventions. Yet he'd begun to categorize all the ideas he sketched out in that way because he never used instruction manuals. His method was to work out for himself what was needed to construct something that had already been made. The process took months and he considered it his true vocation, inventing things that had already been invented. The pleasure he got from the activity was something like what Sunday hikers feel when they reach the summit of some mountain and wonder why personal fulfillment is such a strange sensation. In the mornings, the non-inventor taught in an arts and crafts college without any sense of fulfillment, despite the fact that his students found his workshops useful. Since childhood, he'd had the desire to travel to spits of land that extended into the sea or to an uninhabited islands. Once, when he was 18, his mother and father invited him to go to Tabaka promising that it was a deserted island. He thought that it would be a wilderness, but what he found was seven streets of poor houses, a high wall, a church, a lighthouse, two hotels and a small harbor. His parents had probably exaggerated the isolation of Tabaka uh, to persuade him to spend the vacation with them. They didn't like the idea of leaving him home alone But it's also possible they never really understood what he meant by uninhabited places. 
it was no easy task to count the number of river islands on the stretch of the Guadalquivir that adjoined the city. Some could be mistaken for small isthmuses. One September morning, he walked to the dock carrying his canoe and took to the water. He spent several days getting the hang of the vessel, but once he had, he started to explore. There had been no rain for weeks. The river was very low. The water was still and smelled really bad. He skirted the islands with a mixture of anxiety and astonishment without ever managing to take the canoe ashore. He wasn't confident of his ability to make rapid maneuvers, feared that the shorelines might be muddy, that he would slip and his canoe would drift away. And the thought of having to swim back with his mouth tightly closed to avoid swallowing the putrid water scared him. As did the lush, brightly colored vegetation, buzzing with insects and the layer of bird shit on the ground. A landscape he'd believed to be beautiful was no more than trees deformed by the weight of birds or perhaps some disease, colonies of bugs and shrubs rotted by the filth. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for that beautiful reading. Gracias a las dos para esta lectura tan bella, tan bonita. Excellent. Um, so I have a few questions for both of you, actually. Um, to start off, though, Elvira, congratulations on your big day. Um, and then secondly, how did this collection begin for you and what was your inspiration? Uh, because I know you've said before in previous interviews that you see writing as an open process which should surprise the writer as they write. And I wondered kind of how these stories came to you as surprises. Uh, bueno, tengo, perdón, sí, tengo unas preguntas para las dos y voy a empezar por Elvira. Eh, ¿Cómo empezó esta colección de cuentos? ¿no? Eh, ¿Cuál fue la inspiración? Tú has dicho que eh, ves la escritura como un proceso abierto que debe sorprender uh, a medida que se, que se escribe. ¿no? ¿Y fue así que nacieron estos cuentos? Sí, los cuentos para mí tienen un impulso muy misterioso. A diferencia de una novela, que es un proceso, el de la novela, donde a pesar de internarme en un territorio que voy conociendo a medida que escribo, eh, una novela ta se tarda mucho tiempo, o por lo menos más tiempo, y más tiempo vas pensando en la novela, entonces eh, vas haciendo muy consciente los motivos, los propios motivos de la escritura e incluso eh, creo que también eh, a diferencia del cuento, las novelas tienen eh, el tema en primer plano, mientras que un cuento siempre es un impulso misterioso porque no se sabe de dónde viene, los cuentos me, me toman por sorpresa, no, nunca sé eh, por qué un día de repente aparece una imagen y yo tengo que sentarme a escribir, a menudo tengo que atrapar ese personaje o situación a toda velocidad porque si no aprovecho ese impulso es como si el cuento se escapara. Y, ¿Puedo? Sí. Gracias. No, 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 tranquila. Uh, well, yes, uh, th that's how they started. Um, let's say that short stories have this kind of mysterious impulse, uh, unlike novels. Novels uh, are a process. They take, um, you, you get inside this kind of territory as you write, and um, they take more time. Uh, that means that you think about the novel novel for more time uh, and this way you become conscious of the reasons why you write in it and unlike stories uh, novel, novels uh, have their uh, 
keep their theme, their topic um, as their main priority. Uh, whereas um, short stories take you by surprise. Um, one day this image comes to my mind and I just have to sit down and trap it, trap that image, trap that uh, character in order not to, not to make it escape. Sí, también pienso que los cuentos están muy cerca de la poesía porque un cuento es un concentrado de tiempo y de significado. El significado siempre está implícito y para mí misma es un misterio. Uh -huh. Well, I think that uh, short stories are very close to poetry uh, because uh, they are a concentration of time and meaning and meaning is often implied. And therefore, they are a kind of mystery to me. That's such a beautiful way to put it. Um, and me, me encanta este punto de vista, me encanta como lo pones. Gracias. I love the distinction too between the length of the novel and kind of that quick compression of the short story, which you master so well. Uh, me interesa mucho esta, digamos, esta relación entre uh, lo largo que es una novela y lo corto que es un cuento, ¿no? Y me gusta la, la manera que tienes tú de manejar las dos cosas. Gracias. Oh, Thank so you. What was the first story that began for you in this collection? How did it begin? ¿Cuál fue la primera, el primer cuento en esta colección? Que, la, el primer cuento que empezó para ti. El primer cuento... Hay dos primeros cuentos. Hay un primer cuento en el tiempo que yo escribo hace 20 años mm -hmm. eh, cuando estoy en París. Eh, estudiando y vivo en la periferia y eh, en una periferia muy dura lo que allí llaman Valier eh, 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 ¿cómo decir? resultaba muy difícil a veces incluso orientarse porque son sitios que crecieron a toda velocidad y muy desolados. Y me perdí. Y cuando conseguí encontrar la salida de aquel laberinto, un día, eh, ya en la residencia escribí eh, París Periferí que es un cuento muy cortito. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I have two first short stories and the first one relates with time. Um, I've been writing for 20 years. Um, well, since when I was in Paris, I was studying there and I was uh, living in the outskirts. Uh, and it was a very hard um, outskirt area. Uh, one of those places that in French are called banlieue. Um, in this place, it was quite hard to to orient, so get ori oriented, find directions. And um, because they are places that have grown very quickly, uh, and they are very, very sad and isolated places. So it turns out that I got lost. And when I found my way uh, after some time, I went back to, uh, to, to, I went back home and I wrote Paris Periphery. Eh, y hay otro origen que es cuando pienso el libro entero que es cuando mm, empiezo a escribir el, el cuento que he leído el, bueno, he leído solo el principio el de la isla de los conejos 
Y eso fue en 2000, 2014. Acababa de publicar una novela. Hacía mucho tiempo que, que no escribía cuento, porque mi cabeza había estado ocupada en, en dos novelas que había escrito de manera sucesiva. Y un día, yo soy de... Mi familia es del sur de España y viven en, en Córdoba y el río Guadalquivir atraviesa la ciudad y en Córdoba hace un calor eh, espantoso en verano y solo se puede salir a pasear cuando el sol ha caído y paseando por el Guadalquivir recordé un apunte que yo tenía de una historia que me había contado un amigo que me dijo que había llevado conejos a una isleta del Guadalquivir. Fue algo que me contaron y que yo apunté porque me, me parecía extraño. ¿no? ¿Por, qué? ¿Por qué llevas conejos a una isleta de un río? Y me dijo, ¿por qué no? ¿No? Entonces yo ese verano me acordé de esa idea que tenía apuntada y miraba las isletas y sentía un impulso muy fuerte de escribir y cuando terminé de escribir ese cuento luego empecé a escribir otro y luego otro y me di cuenta que había un libro uh, there is um, another kind of origin to my to my short stories and books um, sometimes i think the entire i think about the entire book um, Other times, uh, as it happened for uh, the short story uh, I read uh, this evening, well, the short passage I read this evening, uh, it was 2014, and I had just published uh, a novel, and I hadn't written any uh, short stories for some time, uh, because I had been um, busy with two novels, uh, but uh, one day I was uh, with my family, well, my family lives in Córdoba in the south of Spain and Córdoba is crossed by the river Guadalquivir and in Córdoba it is extremely hot in the summer uh, you really can't go out you can only go out um, when the sun goes down because otherwise it's too hot and um, uh, during one of these walks I remembered about a story they told me a friend told me that he had taken Uh, some rabbits to one of these islands in the river and uh, um, it, it felt strange to me why would you do that and at the same time I thought well why not so as I was walking along the river and watching these islands and taking a look at these islands I remembered uh, this story and I felt an impulse uh, to write and uh, I started to write uh, story after story and I realized it was a book That's an incredible origin story. Did you ever figure out why he took the rabbits to the island? I have to ask. <laughs> uh, pues es una manera increíble de, de escribir un libro, ¿no? De, de empezar a escribir un libro. ¿Y descubriste por qué llevó lo, los conejos a la isleta? Eh, no, no porque este amigo que llevó los conejos es... También el personaje en el que yo me inspiro para el cuento, este amigo es inventor, es inventor de, de verdad, no es un falso inventor, inventa todo el tiempo todo tipo de, de objetos de, y tiene siempre ideas muy extravagantes y las lleva a cabo. Creo que, creo que todo ese, ese impulso que tiene de llevar todas sus ideas a cabo eh, forma parte de su proceso creativo entonces él no tenía una explicación de por qué había llevado conejos simplemente bueno pues eh, él, él siempre hace todo lo que se le ocurre y él, ese día se le ocurrió aquello Uh, well, really, no. Uh, I don't know why. Um, because, well, this friend, he, he, well, is um, the person I inspire to uh, for the character of this uh, short story. And, um, well, he's a real inventor. Uh, he invents all kinds of things. And uh, he has these strange ideas. And he feels the impulse to realize all of his ideas. Um, 
that, that that's his uh, his way of being creative right and he really didn't have an explanation or about this so i don't really know why he did it <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> incredible um you know there there's something here um you've said before alvira that as far as control goes it's something i don't believe in we are not in control of what happens and attempting to exercise control generates too much suffering. It's better to just relax. I love this approach and I wonder, one, how did you come here? And two, how does that inform your writing? Uh, Elvira, uh, tú has dicho que uh, con respecto al control uh, es algo en el que no crees, ¿no? Um, porque no tenemos control de lo que sucede, de lo que ocurre y tratar de ejercer el control uh, genera demasiado sufrimiento para otras personas y para nosotros mismos. Entonces lo mejor es relajarnos, ¿no? Y me encanta, me encanta este punto de vista. ¿Cómo llegaste ahí? ¿Cómo lo aplicas en tu trabajo? Eh, bueno, llegué ahí porque, porque yo creo que vivimos en, en sociedades que quieren controlarlo todo. Y incluso, bueno, esto es un, una idea ya de antigua de, de la filosofía francesa de los años 70, eh, que estas sociedades eh, eh, incluso han llegado a colonizar de, digamos, todo nuestro, incluso, incluso el cuerpo, ¿no? todo lo, lo que llamaban el biopoder. Y o sea como creo que los individuos, por lo menos de las sociedades occidentales, vivimos obsesionados con, por ejemplo, el tema de la salud, hacer deporte, cuidarnos, si comemos esto vamos a vivir más años, si hacemos X cosas. Es decir, tenemos toda, tenemos toda la vida compartimentada en una serie de creencias que si, hacemos, si estudiamos esta carrera nos va a ir bien. Si, es decir, y, todo, y en realidad todo es falso, o sea, porque continuamente hay excepciones a eso. Y además, si te obsesionas con eso, al final te conviertes en una persona absolutamente rígida, incluso, incluso enferma. ¿no? Y entonces, eh, yo creo que, que todo proceso creativo eh, va en un sentido distinto, porque creo que todo creador descubre que, que los procesos, eh, no sé, pintar, escribir, componer música, tienen un componente incontrolable y además es, es en ese adentrarse en lo que no conocemos, lo que está fuera de nuestro control, donde acontecen los encuentros o, o por lo menos eh, así es en mi caso. Si, además lo controlado ya es conocido de antemano, entonces no hay creación en un proceso que uno controla de antemano. Y entiendo que la creación tiene, tiene mucho de... Mmm, de exploración, de, de soltar, de, de renunciar a lo que sabes. Ok. Um, well, I got there because I believe that we live uh, in society that wants to have everything under control. And this comes from uh, an old uh, French philosophy uh, dating back to the 1970s. Um, and well, the idea was that uh, we, the society had colonized everything, even our body, and that goes to biopower. Um, but I think that especially in the Western world, we are obsessed with health, with uh, what we eat, uh, we want to keep healthy. Uh, it's as if we lived a, a life uh, that was divided into different departments. Uh, so we believe that if we study a certain thing, everything is going to be all right. But it's not true, it's false. And 
the only result is that we this turns us into uh, rigid people. Um, but in my opinion, uh, the creative process goes in a totally different direction. Either you paint or you write or you compose music. Uh, it's un something that goes beyond our control, uh, or at least this is how it is for me. Um, if it's something we control, it's something that we already know. But this is not how creation works. Creation has to do with exploration. Uh, it has to do with giving up something that we know. That's a beautiful answer. And I, I really relate to that. I also um, am super curious because often we try to classify art and literature and words like surreal and avant-garde have been applied to your work. And I was curious if those resonate with you or if you identify your work as something else altogether. Pues me encanta tu respuesta y me reconozco completamente. Y también porque a veces en literatura tendemos un poco a clasificar las cosas, ¿no? En tu caso, um, hablan, hablando de tu obra, se usaron la palabra surrealista, vanguardista, y me pregunto si te parecen correctas, hablando de ti, ¿no? de tu trabajo, ¿cómo clasifica tu obra? Um... Yo siempre pienso que, que los creadores somos los peores críticos de, de o por lo menos los que, los que menos autorizados estamos a poner una categoría a, nuestra, a nuestras obras porque las tenemos demasiado de encima. Entonces, eh, no sé muy bien... No sé muy bien si, si, si mi literatura... Eh, es vanguardista. Las, eh, supongo que depende de qué, en qué contexto. Entiendo que siempre el, el, el concepto de vanguardia es un concepto relativo, porque siempre depende de eh, si tu obra es distinta o está haciendo algo nuevo, pero con respecto a qué. Y luego, por otra parte, siempre es un... A día de hoy siempre es problemático utilizar la, el término vanguardia porque parece que esté ya todo, todo hecho y, y también porque está muy vinculado al periodo en el que surge, que es el periodo de entreguerras. Y, y, pero bueno, digamos que el término se usa de una manera mucho más coloquial, menos, eh, menos académica y, y no, sé, no sé decir si yo soy muy vanguardista o no, sé que me gustan los experimentos eh, pero no me gusta imponer el experimento a un texto sino que yo voy siguiendo eh, como si fuera un médico que está interpretando los síntomas de un cuerpo yo interpreto los síntomas del texto y, eh, y me voy dejando llevar por esos síntomas hacia a ver dónde, hacia dónde me conduce. Nunca, nunca le impongo una forma, nunca digo voy a ser vanguardista, o sea, que el texto me, me lleva. Uh, well, um, I think that uh, creators in general uh, are the worst uh, critics about their own works. Uh, and they are not pro probably the best people to classify their own works. And so I don't really know if my work can be defined as vanguard. Um, and on top of that, the vanguard concept is relative because it depends uh, on uh, how different is your work compared to something else. And it depends what this something else is. Um, um, and in addition, when we use the vanguard, uh, the classification vanguard, um, it seems that everything has already been done also because uh, it dates back to the period between the two wars. Um, but I guess that today this word is used in a less academical uh, form. Um, what I know is that I like to experiment, but I do not impose this experimentation to my text. I let the text to uh, take me somewhere. I'm like a doctor that tries to interpret the symptoms of 
uh, an illness of a patient. And this is what I do with my tax. I, I try to uh, interpret the symptoms and I let the text guide me somewhere. Excellent, that makes sense. Um, yeah, would you mind if I said something here, just uh, listening to what Elvira says, I feel that sense of, of as a translator also, you, you know, it's a creative act, but at the same time, you are within the text, you're moving with the text, you might want to experiment, but the experiment is not the important thing. If there's experimentation ever, it's because the text demands it. And that's really interesting to feel uh, with Elvira that, you know, there's that kind of relation between her writing and also translation. I was going to ask about that too, but you go first. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, sí, me, me gustaría añadir algo porque escuchando tus palabras, Elvira, um, también traducir es un proceso creativo. Eh, el traductor se mueve al interior del texto, eh, quiere experimentar eh, y crea una relación, digamos, con el texto. Entonces, eh, me gusta esta definición. Eh, sí, y en cuanto a si es surrealista, eh, mm, no sé, diría que... No sé, porque me viene, me viene a la cabeza también un uso del, del término surrealista muy, muy académico. Pienso también en, eh, en, en la novela surrealista Nadia de André Breton, que es, que es verdaderamente experimental y es una novela eh, muy difícil de leer incluso. Y entonces no, no sé hasta qué punto, eh, no, quizás no diría... No diría que es exactamente surrealista, pero sí genera o sí busca un efecto que es usado muchísimo por los surrealistas, que es el efecto del extrañamiento, que en el surrealismo eh, se lleva, eh, se explora, eh, puesto que se trataba, entre otras cosas, de, de romper los automatismos de la imaginación. Eh, pues los surrealistas siempre eh, exploran territorios, eh, mm, en fin, inéditos, si queréis, o eh, a priori no en absoluto evidentes. Pero me gusta más la palabra eh, o, o la referencia a lo extraño, más que al surrealismo. Um, with reference to... Well, being surrealist, uh, again, I don't know. Um, uh, when I hear this word, it makes me think about something very academic. Uh, I think about Andre Breton uh, novels that were very difficult to read. Um, so really, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't really know if I'm a surrealist. Um, what I like in surrealism, and, and I think that um, you can find my text is that feeling of exile, let's say, um, which I explore. And probably in that sense, I can be defined uh, as realist. Excellent. Um, so there were, there's another question I have of place. Um, you know, you're really, despite the sort of dreamlike aspects uh, they're also very centered in a place. And we also have a question from the audience that is similar to one that I had queued up. Um, how do you feel like place impacts your work, including the different neighborhoods of Madrid? Or how do they impact your characters um, and help inhabit the worlds you shape and create for them? And thanks, Hillary, for that question. Can you say that again? Sorry. <laughs> um, how does place impact your work? Um, and how do you feel that different places like such as neighborhoods in Madrid have impacted your characters um, and shape and the worlds that are shaped and created for them. Um, en tus libros, los lugares tienen un papel eh, importante. ¿Y cómo, cómo impactan estos lugares, como por ejemplo alguna, algunas zonas de Madrid? ¿Cómo impactan estos lugares en los protagonistas? Eh, 
sí, es, es, es muy importante lo, los lugares. En muchas ocasiones, lo primero que se me ocurre cuando escribo es el lugar. Eh, y a veces, en el caso concreto de, de, de los cuentos de la isla de los conejos, hay una cantidad considerable de cuentos que surgen eh, una vez que el libro se pone en marcha eh, muchas de las ideas que, que me empiezan a surgir para los cuentos eh, es, aparecen cada vez que hago un viaje como si cambiarme de lugar me llevara a imaginar situaciones de ficción y eh, a mí me gusta mucho caminar eh, por la ciudad por Madrid he caminado mucho porque es el sitio donde vivo, pero creo que me pasaría con cualquier ciudad, incluso con el campo. Y voy buscando... Es, es algo difícil de explicar para mí. Eh, voy buscando las sensaciones que me, da, que me dan los espacios. Y muchas veces esas sensaciones me llevan a escribir, pero el motivo de eso... Es misterioso para mí también, pero es muy divertido, me lo paso muy bien. Um, well, places play a fundamental role. They play a very important role. And um, very often, the first thing I think about in, my, in, my, in what I write is uh, a place. And in this particular case, in, the, in Rabbit Island, um, there are different, uh, many different uh, stories that are generated in different places. Uh, very often, I have this inspiration, these images when I travel. Uh, I, for example, I love to walk uh, in the cities. I, for example, I have walked a lot in Madrid because this is where I live. But I think that the same would happen uh, even though, even if I lived in the countryside. And it's not easy for me to explain it, but it is, it's as if I looked for uh, the feelings, the sensations that I receive from each place I, I am in, each place I visit. And it's, uh, it's very hard to explain. It's still a mystery to me, but I just love it. I love that there's still mystery. Uh, me encanta que, que siga siendo un misterio. Uh, excellent. We also have a few questions that were queued up and also were next on my list uh, about the translation process between um, Christina and Elvira. Not only have you translated multiple works, Christina, um, but we'd love to hear about how the collaboration process went um, and perhaps a little bit of what the process looked like for you. Thank you. Um, tengo algunas preguntas sobre el proceso de traducción entre la colaboración entre eh, Elvira y Cristina y cómo, cómo funciona este proceso de colaboración. Okay, so just um, going back to what Elvira was saying about walking the city of Madrid. Um, if I go back to when we started working together for La Travadora, the working woman, um, I realized very quickly in that sense that, that Madrid was a character in the novel. And I have to confess to my absolute shame that although I know parts of Spain very well, I had never been to Madrid. So the first thing I decided to do was that I had to go to Madrid and get to know this character. And one of my most beautiful memories is that Elvira met me for lunch. She took time out. We sat together with my maps of the city on the table in the restaurant and she drew out all the routes that um, appear in a working woman. And I even, I had a little route around tonight and I even found, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a map that Elvira drew for me. Wow. Is that usually part of your translation process? This is, that's such an incredible trip to take. <laughs> uh, 
sorry, um, Mate. Yeah, if, to... if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, pues, uh, retomando lo que estabas diciendo, Elvira, sobre el andar, caminar en las ciudades, um, uh, me acuerdo que cuando empecé a trabajar en la trabajadora, en la traducción de la trabajadora, uh, entendí perfectamente que Madrid era un personaje y... Uh, en esa época yo conocía muchísimas partes de España muy bien, pero nunca había sido a Madrid. Entonces, en ese momento decidí que tenía que ir a conocer a este personaje y me acuerdo que encontré a Elvira en un restaurante. Yo tenía un mapa de la ciudad y ella me diseñó todas las, las rutas que aparecían en, en la trabajadora. ¿no? Y luego enseñó el, 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 el mapa que tú dibujaste por ella. Me ha encantado ver el mapa, Cristina. I love seeing the map, Cristina. Um, I think, Sari, you were asking if that's usual in my process. Sara, creo que estabas preguntando si es algo de costumbre en mi proceso. I do very much think that the dialogue between um, an author and a translator is extremely important. It can't always be as beautiful as meeting for lunch and having a wonderful time and feeling that it's Elvira introduced me to the city that she knew um, but it can occur in, in very different ways in the kind of dialogue you do in questions and answers either in Spanish in English whatever feels right and I think that dialogue for me certainly is part of the process of understanding the work um, of finding the voices that are within that work, knowing the voice of the author, knowing the way that she puts herself into a text or creates a text. And to me, that is really an important part of my process. I mean, obviously sometimes one has to, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> cat. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes it's not possible to, to be in touch with an author or maybe an author doesn't really want to be involved. But to me, I find it much more fruitful. If you can have a dialogue, you can sort of just do something like talking about what a city means. Um, well, I think that uh, the dialogue between the author and the translator is very, very important. Uh, just as much as meeting Elvira for lunch uh, and uh, having her showing me the city that she knew, um, uh, uh, th that's very important and it happens in many different ways. But this dialogue is, dialogue is part of the process. It's part of the process of understanding the work. It's part of the process of understanding, of getting to know the voice that are inside uh, this work, the, the, the author voice and so on. So it's really part of the process. And uh, I must say that sometimes it's not always possible to be in touch with authors. Some do not want to be disturbed by the translator. But in my, in my opinion, when it happens, it's so much better. I... So curiously about this part, do you feel like, um, Christina, this is kind of a question for both Christina and Elvira. Um, one, do you feel like this is a pretty collaborative process? And two, um, Christina, this is the second book that you've worked on with Elvira. So how do you feel like you, that might inform your translations? Do you feel like you have more of a sense of her work and that might make it a little bit easier? And then I'd love to hear from Elvira's side, what the collaboration looked like in terms of translation. Es una pregunta para las dos. Um, ¿Os parece que eh, eh, cuál es vuestra sensación con respecto a este eh, proceso de colaboración? 
Um, y luego, Cristina, uh, este es el segundo libro que tú has traducido por Elvira y um, sientes que estás más adentro de su forma de escribir, de, de, su, um, sí, de, de, su, de su obra. Um, maybe it would be nice if uh, Elvira could talk about the collaboration because it's easy for me, but I don't know how she feels about it. So that would be nice for you to start, Elvira. Elvira, a lo mejor quieres empezar tú, uh, porque para mí es muy fácil explicar nuestra colaboración, pero a lo mejor uh, quieres empezar tú uh, exp explicando qué es por ti esta colaboración. Um... Yo, vamos, para, para mí Cristina ha puesto las cosas muy, muy, muy fáciles porque eh, eh, ella es muy, muy clara en sus preguntas y, y, y lo que más me ha gustado de ella, realmente cuando vino a Madrid a, a conocer la ciudad, eh, mm, para, para, para ver el Madrid de la trabajadora, eh, yo sentí que aquello era una entrega de Cristina hacia el libro. Me pareció, me pareció absolutamente maravilloso. O sea, más allá de conocerla, eh, es la, la, era la primera vez que alguien hacía algo semejante por, por un libro mío. Eh, de, venir a, a la ciudad y además recorrer, recorrer esos sitios. Y a mí eso me dio la, la talla, la enorme talla como traductora eh, de Cristina y su enorme entrega. Y, y luego cuando, en el proceso más concreto, en realidad la, la colaboración ha sido muy fácil porque bueno ya me, me, me plantea dudas, no muchas porque es una gran traductora, entonces ella entiende... La sensación que yo tengo es que cuando ella me plantea las dudas es que entiende muy bien los libros y, y es muy fácil entablar el diálogo, por lo menos para mí ha sido muy sencillo, no sé si para Cristina ha sido tan sencillo. Uh, well, Cristina made things very easy for me. Um because she asks very clear questions. And when she came to Madrid to get to know the Madrid of the working woman, I felt that that was her commitment, that she was really committed towards uh, the book. And that was the first time that somebody ever did something like that for one of my books. And in that moment, I understood her commitment. Therefore, I must say that collaboration with her is very easy. Uh, she asks uh, if she has some doubts, she asks about it. And she's really a great translator. And uh, when she asks me her doubts, I understand that uh, she understands well the book. So really, this is how it feels for me. I don't know how it feels if, if it's just as easy for you, Christina. Uh, I'd say um, I'm glad my questions were clear because I know your answers were always extremely clear and were really so helpful. And also um, were very helpful when it came to the editing process that they gave me the confidence to be able to say, no, it has to be this way, something like that. Oh, have we lost over here? Um, anyway. Um, I think you were asking Sarah about the the uh, perhaps the different voices between the books, and I do think there is a, a great difference between a working woman and Rabbit Island, and perhaps it has to do with what Elvira was saying earlier about the difference between a novel and the short story. So in a Rabbit Island there is that sense that you're having to move focus and move voice you know between stories and perhaps as a translator the process is much more abridged you know you don't write a story over years you're translating over a period of months so i think that was kind of challenging in finding all these voices that distinction makes sense i'll let marta thank you um, well, I ask clear questions, uh, 
perdona, pregunto, pregunto eh, pre, eh, hago preguntas claras porque tú me das respuestas claras eh, y tus respuestas siempre me ayudan, me ayudan mucho y también me, me ayudó también en, en la fase de, de revisión. Y Sara, antes tú hablaba de la, eh, preguntaba sobre las distintas voces dentro del libro y claro que sí, hay una diferencia entre la trabajadora y la isla de los conejos eh, y me refiero a lo que decía Elvira antes sobre la diferencia entre una novela y, y un cuento. Eh, el proceso es totalmente distinto, el enfoque es distinto y lo mismo pasa en la traducción, es un enfoque completamente distinto. Excellent. I think the, the question, Christina, that came from the audience was whether it becomes easier to translate someone after you've worked with them before. And I didn't know, it, less so that they would be the same, but more um, as you become more familiar with Elvira um, and this friendship that you've developed, if maybe it gets a little bit easier on the second go round. <laughs> I don't know. Eh, la pregunta era sobre eh, la facilidad, digamos, de traducción eh, después de, de colaborar con una autora durante un tiempo, ¿no? Eh, traducir a alguien que ya has traducido, a lo mejor lo hace, te lo pone más fácil y además que hay una amistad entre eh, las dos, a lo mejor va a facilitar todo el proceso de, de, de colaboración y de trabajo. I think uh, you talked about friendship, Sarah. Um... And I think that's really important. I, I also think building up trust with the authors you work with, so that that sense that you could, I can trust Elvira to, to give me feedback, to tell me when I'm, you know, sort of when I have questions, she's going to tell me clearly, but she should be able to trust me to present her work in a way that's honest and things like that. So it, I think it's sense of, it's difficult to say that you kind of know an author because you've done more books because creative people don't do the same thing the whole time. They are not so, mostly they are not just repeating themselves and they are people in the process of developing their own art. And so that changes, and that changes as you know, we all grow older, we all develop, we do new things. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's I love working with authors over, um, you know, more than one book, but it's never the same thing. Um, Sara, tú has mencionado la, la amistad y, y es un aspecto fundamental muy importante y también eh, quiero subrayar la confianza, ¿no? eh, la confianza entre eh, nosotras, eh, Elvira me puede dar eh, un, un feedback, un, digamos, un, puede hacer unos comentarios sobre eh, mi trabajo y, y sé que puedo confiar en ella y, y creo que ella pueda confiar en mí. Eh, pero decir si sí, eh, traducir es más fácil cuando ya conoces a un autor, pues no sé, es bastante difícil porque cada libro es distinto eh, y, y es todo un mundo, todo un mundo distinto. El arte cambia, ¿no? Porque cambiamos nosotros, cambiamos, envejecemos, hacemos cosas distintas. Entonces, eh, nunca, nunca es lo mismo. Eh, pero me encanta, sí, trabajar con autores que conozco. Um, I think we're just about at time. Um, but this was so wonderful. Thank you so much, Elvira, Christina, Sarah, for your conversation. It was so great to hear Elvira talk about her work. And Marta, you were just so wonderful with interpreting. Um, truly amazing. Um, I thought this discussion was just like, it was so interesting. And, and I loved hearing everyone's viewpoints. And um, thank you so much, everyone. It helps to... So smart. <laughs> Creo que nos es, se nos ha acabado el tiempo y ha sido maravilloso escuchar esta charla y escuchar el día hablar de la, de la isla de los conejos. Entonces, gracias a todos y a, a todas. Muchas gracias, Sara, Marta, Cristina. 
Muchísimas gracias a todos. Ha sido un placer. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. <laughs> And congratulations again, Elvira. Gracias. Gracias. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you again. So much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night. Good night.